In this video, I'll break down exactly how camper van solar works. Everything from the panel on the roof to powering everything inside your van. And whether this is the first time you've installed solar or whether you're just tired of guessing, we're here to help. If you're feeling a bit overwhelmed about your own solar setup, then don't worry. In this video, we're going to cover everything that you're going to need for a simple, reliable solar setup for your camper van. We're going to cover everything from solar panels, batteries, charge controllers, inverters, and wiring and fuses. Let's get into it. Solar power is what essentially makes van life feel kind of free because you're essentially charging your batteries while you're just going about your business. You can be parked anywhere and still be running all of your essential appliances in your van, given the right solar array on your roof. It's a clean, renewable resource. So it's power literally from the sun straight into the batteries in your van. So when you're using your appliances, you're taking the power from your batteries and then the batteries is taking that power from your panel and straight from, straight from the sunshine. You'll get more power on a sunny day than you will do in a cold winter's day, but you're still gonna be getting a, a small trickle of power. So while you're away from the vehicle, it's still recharging. You don't need a campground and you don't need a generator. It's just good, clean, renewable energy. And if you're looking for off-grid freedom, then it's not just a, a luxury, it's an essential. There are two main types of solar panels. So this one is called a semi-flexible. You also get a, what's called a rigid frame panel. A rigid frame panel is largely the same kind of thing. It's made up of different materials. So in this one here, we have some different layers of plastic with the solar cells sandwiched in between. The top layer of plastic is clear and it's just to provide some protection for the cells so they don't get damaged. So the sun rays come in, gathered in here and turned into electricity, which you can then send into your vehicle to charge your battery and your appliances. In a rigid frame panel, you'll have an aluminium frame round about the outside, and then you'll have the solar cells underneath a glass panel. It's called a rigid panel, obviously, because it's rigid, and this one is obviously flexible. This is a semi-flexible panel, so it has a good bit of flex to it. And what these are really good for is if you're fitting it to a non-flat surface. So if you've got a pop top roof and the, the roof is slightly curved, has any sort of shape to it, then this will follow the form of either the van skin roof or the, the pop top fiberglass roof. These are very good as well because they don't have any sort of wind drag. This is only two mil thick. And so when, once this is bonded down onto the roof of your van, you won't know anything about it. You won't you have any sort of wind noise, any sort of drag that comes from it. The other benefit to this panel is that this has what's called a rear junction box, which means that the cable gland is at the back of the panel. You can also get a top junction box, but what that then means is you'll have the cables coming out from the side of the top of the junction box, and then you'll, you'll see them on the top of the van. That then means that you'll need to find a way to put them down through the roof, whereas what we do with this is we'll cut a hole into the top of the fiberglass of the pop top roof or through the roof skin of the van. We'll then drop this cable gland through and bond this onto the roof over the top of it. What that leaves you with is all the gubbins hidden underneath the solar panel and all you see is this rectangle on top of the van which is really nice and neat and really waterproof. Now with a rigid frame panel the cable gland will be underneath as well, it'll be underneath the panel but you, you don't need to worry about it so much because rigid frames will stick up above. You're going to need some mounting brackets to mount that onto the roof of your van or onto uh, the roof of your pop top and it will provide some, some wind drag. The benefit and the reason that some people will use rigid frame panels is because they tend to last longer, they have a longer life expectancy, and they perform slightly better as well. You'll get more wattage of power from them um, over a longer period of time. For charge controllers, this is the little box that sits in between your solar panel and your battery bank. And what this does is it takes the power from the solar panel and it makes it safe for your batteries so you don't overcharge them and overheat your batteries by giving them too much feed at the one time. Um, so you get different types, you get a PWM and you get an MPPT. This one here is an MPPT controller. These are be generally better, they're, they cost a bit more money. In my opinion, I think they're very much worth it. They're much better in colder, colder environments, colder climates, and they're much better when the sun isn't continuous. If you're sitting in Spain, you can maybe get away with a P PWM when you know it, it's gonna be guaranteed sun all day, but where the, the sun's changeable throughout the day as it is in the UK, then these work much more efficiently. Um, you have different levels of charge on here. It tells you on the front, you've got different lights, which traffic lights which show it. It starts off with a blue LED, which gives you your bulk charge. This is where it gives you maximum amount of charge into the battery to get it off from, from being completely empty to the first stage of charge. Then it moves on to absorption charge and the, the light goes yellow. This is where the majority of the charging gets done, but over an extended period of time. And it's a continuous amount of charge. It keeps it at the same level for quite a while until the battery's sitting around about 98%. 
and then the green LED indicates that it's on a float charge. Now, a float charge means that it's just going to maintain the battery level. It's going to got it up to a certain point, about 98%, and then it's going to take it up to 100, and then it will cycle it, it will bring it down by 0.2 of a, a percent, and then take it back up. Batteries don't like to sit stagnant, they like to be continuously cycled, and it keeps them healthy, and that's what this little box is going to do. So from your solar panel to your charge controller, the power ends up in your battery. This is what's going to power all your appliances after the sun goes down in your van. This here is a lead acid battery. You can also fit AGM or lithium batteries. It's just about how the different batteries are made up and how they store power. What you want to focus on is the size of the battery, the capacity, and how long that's going to last and how long it's going to take to charge. Now, a lead acid will take longer to charge than a lithium as well as an AGM battery. Lead acids are going to be much heavier. So for the same size battery bank, if you had 300 amp hours of battery power in your van, if it was lead acid, that's a lot of weight to put in the back of your vehicle. Lithium is going to be a fraction of that. Lithium will cost you a little bit more, but it takes up less space, it takes up less weight, and it charges much faster than a standard lead acid battery. For us, it's a no-brainer. It's all we fit these days. This is actually one that we stripped out of a customer's van to replace it with a lithium setup. If you want to draw 240 volts from your setup, then you're going to need an inverter. What it will do is it will draw 12 volts from your existing battery setup and it will convert it into 240 volts for your 13 amp household sockets you have in the van. This will allow you to then use any of your, your products um, that you need a three pin plug to charge, so laptops, hair dryers, that sort of thing. And if you have an induction hob, as we do in this van, you're going to need a large inverter. The size will depend on the products you're looking to power. It will tell you on the back of the product how much power it draws, and you can then draw your conclusion as to what size inverter you need. There are calculators online for you to do this. Um, we've fitted a 3000 watt inverter in this one because we're a gasless van, and because we've got that induction hob, it will then allow us enough, enough current to power up those items. So in the front of your charge controllers, you'll see there's numbers on here. It says MPPT 75, 15. What do they mean, Stu? Okay, so the 75 is the solar panel voltage that this MPPT controller can handle. And the 15 is the current for the charging or the output of the MPPT. So how do you know how much your panel? Your panel? So this is like a 200 so, watt panel. So this is a 200 watt panel, um, but it could be 200 watts at 12 volts, it could be 200 watts at 50 volts, you don't know. So it's usually on the back of the panel. Okay. So it will state on there 200 watts, like this one does, and it tells you this maximum system voltage, 600 volts. Doesn't mean it'll give you 600 volts, it just means that in a bank of solar panels all joined together, if you exceed, That's the max you'd be able if you to start get. to exceed 600 volts, you're going to start to have an issue with your panels. And so singly with this panel, yes, the, the max is 17.6. So voltage at max power 17.6. Okay. So that would be at 11 amps. So in bright daylight, with the load connected, it'll never exceed 17.6 volts. So that falls well within our 75. Yes, this 75 is a combined voltage. So you could have. So a load you of bank panels. Them. You could have a whole bank of panels, yep. but then you could connect them up differently. So this panel is a 23.8 volts open circuit. So with these wires disconnected with a solar panel in the sun, if you measured across there, you would get 23.8 volts. Okay. That's 75. So this is lower than that, so that's fine. But at full load, this panel will only give you 17.6, where okay. you get other panels which will be higher, others will be lower. And if, when you're buying a panel, the company you're buying it from will be able to advise yes. you what size of charge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you would tell them I am trying to charge a 12 volt battery, or I'm trying to charge 24 volt. And battery. I'm only having one panel. I'm only having however many panels exactly. They will then tell you you want this charge controller because obviously they will know the specs of them and they will match them to the panel. So for a typical solar setup on a van this size, on a transporter size, we'd usually be going for something, we'd usually advise the customer to go between 150, say, and 200, depending on their needs. This customer spends a long time in their van, so they were living between Spain and Glasgow, so they've got two very different climates as well. And so they travel twice a year, back and forth on extended trips. So we've actually fitted a 300 watt panel onto this roof to make sure that it meets their needs, because they're going to get a great pick up from the sun in Spain, whereas when they moved to Scotland, not so much. So they wanted as big a panel as they could have on the space available, and it means they're going to have less problems in the future if it's a cloudy day and they're not actually getting much power from the sun. This panel on this van 
would usually be overkill for, for a lot of people. For their needs, it suited them perfectly. Whereas on a larger van, on a crafter, this is the smallest panel that we would fit really, especially for a gasless van, because we're going to want to maximise the power that we're getting from the sun to recharge our batteries at all times, so that when we come to turn on that induction hob, we've got plenty of time to cook with. So what are the common mistakes that people make when they fit their own panels then? We see quite a few coming into the workshop where people have skipped fuses, that's number one. You don't want to skip your fuses, that's basically your lifesaver, it's the thing that's going to stop fires and it's the thing that's going to save your other products. So if something bad was to happen to your panel, it would maybe stop it from damaging your charge controller. If something bad happens to your battery, it's going to stop it from damaging your charge controller and possibly your panel as well. So it can keep the costs down when it comes to repairs and replacements, but also it can be much safer if you have a fuse to repair than if you, if you have electrical cable going on fire. The other one would be the size of the electrical cable. People just using standard household electrical cable or not using a thick enough gauge. As we discussed earlier on, the size of the cable is really important, especially over a longer run. So cable has a tendency to let the power drop over a longer length. So the longer that length of cable from your panel to your charge controller or from your charge controller to your batteries is, the power that's going to end up at the end of the road is going to be less. So you want to keep it as short as possible and maximise the amount of power that you're getting from that panel. We quite often see people bringing panels to us where they've fitted them wrongly. So the actual fitting of it is very important, especially if you have a semi-flexible panel. It's not so important with the rigid frames because you're going to be fitting those with brackets and it's either on or it's not. Whereas with the semi-flexible, we see people fitting them with silicon, bathroom sealants, that sort of stuff. And yes, they'll bond it down to start with and it'll feel like it's holding on, but over time they just peel away. And if you've got a semi-flexible panel on the top of your roof that's going to be getting a little bit of wind drag, it's just going to whip off and it could cause trouble either to yourselves or to somebody driving behind you. Finally, one of the small mistakes people make, which isn't a safety issue, but it just makes life, life a lot more difficult, is they go to the trouble of fitting a solar panel and fitting a proper electrical system, and then they don't have a battery monitor. So they've no idea how much juice they're getting in their, in their batteries, how much power they're, they're consuming, and how much power they're getting from their panels. The last thing you want to do is step into your vehicle to go on a two week holiday abroad and re not realize that over the winter, your battery has deteriorated and the solar panel is not able to charge it because the, the battery needs replacing. Better to do that before you go, and then you can relax and enjoy your holiday. So is it worth putting a solar setup on your camper van? Absolutely. It gives you the freedom and confidence to go away on that trip without having to worry about your power at all. If you've liked what you've seen, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more van life builds and tips. Now stay powered, stay curious, and we'll see you in the next one.